Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, welcome to Armory 102, the new the la latest class that we've done as part of East Kingdom Heraldic University. And since everybody who's coming is uh, is here, uh, let's get started. I'm going to put up the PowerPoint, and then uh, you guys can look at that instead of at me because it's really much more interesting. Okay. Um, all right. So this uh, class will cover two main uh, topics. It will cover charge group theory, and it will cover the style rules. Uh, we're going to assume that you've uh, either seen the previous class, Armory 101, or otherwise are comfortable with the, the very basics of Armory, and uh, including blazoning. But if you're not sure about something, please feel free to ask a question. So, charge group theory. Uh, the first thing you need to know is that it's an SCA invention. Uh, this is not something you'll find in any treaty, uh, any treatise on uh, period heraldry or Victorian heraldry. It's something we made up, um, and it can. The formal rules for it can be found in Cena Appendix I. Uh, what it is is a really good way to organize uh, charges. Um, to kind of make sense of them. So a charge group is a group of charges uh, approximately same size and visual weight that act as a single visual unit. You know, and we, all of our rules are built around charge groups. So it's very important to, to understand what they are. Um, both style and conflict rules. Um, in fact, core style absolutely requires you to use charge groups to organize things into charge group. Individually attested patterns, you may be able to avoid that. So, the first thing we have is a, what's called a primary charge group. This is always placed directly on the field. It's uh, usually placed in the visual center of the field, and it's usually the largest charge group, the one with the most what we call visual weight. Uh, and not all devices have a primary charge group. The other thing you should know is in almost every case, there are exceptions, but in almost every case, if you have a central ordinary, that's usually the primary charge group. And if you remember from uh, the last class what a central ordinary is, it's any ordinary that crosses the center of the field. The bend, the pale, the fess, the chevron. So, this is argent, a pale, a bend, a sable. What's the primary charge group? That's an interactive question. I will expect responses, otherwise this will get very dull. What's the primary charge group? There's only one possible the band, answer here. The band table. The band. We only have one charge. It's got to be that, right? So a band is a central ordinary. It, pass, it lies directly on the field. It goes through the center of the field. It's the largest and only charge. It's got to be the primary charge group. Here, the primary charge group is two bandlets. We really don't have anything else. And they are of equal visual weight. They're kind of together. So together they form the primary charge group. They're still considered a central ordinary because they're just a type of bend. They happen to be skinny. How about here? What's the primary charge group here? The lion? The lion. It can't be anything else. I mean, the, 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 I'm giving you the easy ones first. I'll we'll get into pretty, harder stuff. It's pretty odd-looking lion. Uh, well, this is a, actually a pretty typical uh, heraldic lion rampant. Um, just one interpretation of it. Right, that's it's interpretation. Yeah. Um, what's the primary charge group here? Three, Three lions. lions rampant. Three lions. How about here? Can we do it? A semi of lions. A semi of lions. A semi of lions. It, it, it really can't be anything else. We don't have anything else for, the, for it. So if you only have one kind of charge group, it's almost always a primary charge group. Again, there are exceptions. So semi of lions. How about here? What's the primary charge group here? Uh, it's the cross. Cross, here. cross. It's the cross. So the cross is a central ordinary, which, as we said, is almost always the primary charge group. Uh, it passes through the center of the field, field, and it does lie on the field, even though it looks like it's lying on top of the lions. Really, it's just clipping. Um, that's just one of the ways you can draw semi. So the cross here is the primary. Now there's a special rule that says if you have a divided field without a central charge, there's nothing right in the middle, then the charges on either side of the division are the primary charge group. So what's the primary charge group here? 
this is a divided field. The lion field. and the cross. The lion and the cross together. And this yeah. is important. This is sometimes throws people. So we have a, a shield divided per fist, and there's nothing right in the middle, so it's got to be whatever is on top and whatever is on the bottom. Lion and a cross. How about here? Lion and a se uh, semi of crosses? Yeah, but the line is so much bigger. You know, can the little crosses be part of the same charge group? There's a lot of little crosses. Well, there's a lot of them, and more importantly, there's really nothing else. The rule says if you have a divided field, and then whatever's on either side has to be the primary charge group. You know, this is, uh, if there was no, if we erased that division line, right, if everything was on the field, then clearly the lion would be the ch primary charge group. It's by far the biggest, the most visual weight. But divided fields have a special rule. What's the, well, I, it's not hidden. Here. So the two crosses and the owl together are a primary charge group. What's the primary charge group here? The owl. The owl. Just the owl. Right? This has a central charge. We said that that rule applies if there's nothing in, no central charge. Here there is. It's just the owl by itself, no crosses. Um, okay, so a, another rule you should be aware of is that a peripheral ordinary, which is something like a chief, a base, a bordure, uh, any of those ordinaries that don't cross the center, they live out on the edges of the field, they can never be a primary church. That's just a rule. Okay. Um, oh, we lost, sorry. Um, so what we have, there's a category of arms called field primary armory. Uh, this is armory where there is either no primary charge group at all, where, there, where there's no primary charge group. Uh, and there's some special rules that apply, and you can get this in one of two ways. You can, it can happen when there's just no charges at all, or it can happen if you only have peripheral ordinaries, because a peripheral ordinary can never be a primary charge group. We will get back to that in a minute. So let's talk about, that was primary charge groups. Let's talk about secondary charge groups. Secondary charge groups, like primaries, are always placed directly on the field, so right on the field. They usually surround the primary charge group in some way. Um, you cannot have a secondary without a primary. Uh, just no way for it to happen. So what's the primary charge? The chevron. The chevron, right? Central ordinary in the middle, crosses the middle of the field. So what's the secondary charge group? The roundels. The roundels. The roundels, the three roundels. Okay? That's the really easy case. You have three of them around the primary charge group. Peripheral ordinaries are often secondary charge groups. So our primary here, it's not a chevron, that's a typo, it's a bend. And what's our secondary charge group? Border. The border. The border. Okay, another common secondary charge group is a semi. What's our primary here? The cross. The cross. The cross. So what's the secondary? It's the semi of lines. Okay. Um, semi by itself is going to be a primary, but if you have anything else with a semi, then almost invariably that something else is the primary and the semi is secondary. Because the semi usually, they're so small, they don't carry much visual weight. So a tertiary group is always placed on another charge, not on the field. Okay, so remember, primary and secondary on the field, tertiary not on the field. Um, and there's a rule that says you can only have one tertiary charge group on a single charge, and I'll show you what that means in a moment. What's the primary charge group? The... Mm. The, the, pale. the vertical line. The pale. Yeah. That's right, the vertical stripe. Is there a secondary the charge? Stars are on the vertical. Three stars. No, there is not a secondary one. There's not a secondary right, because yeah. secondary lives directly on the field. The stars live on the pale. So what's the tertiary charge? Three, the stars. three stars. Three stars. Three mullets. Mullet. Okay, a star is called a mullet in Herald speak. Okay, and if it's five five pointed, is the default. Um, how about now? What's the primary here? The pale. Yep. What's the secondary? None. What's the tertiary? Two uh, mullets and a castle? Two mullets yeah. and a tower. No, it would yeah. be a castle between tower. two mullets. Yeah. Mullet. I would call it a tower, but castle, tower, doesn't matter. Now, this is okay, because the tower and the stars are all kind of the same size, so they're part of the same 
tertiary charge group. It doesn't have to be identical charges. They just have to be clearly the same group. Okay? Now, what about here? What have we got here? What's our primary ch uh, charge? Um, the pale. Still the pale. What's our, and there's no ter secondaries again, what's our tertiary charge here? The tower. The tower. What about the star? Doesn't hold equal weight with the well, tower? Well, it's a tertiary, right? Because it's on another charge. It, but it, this is not an acceptable design because clearly that tower and that star are so different that they're not part of the same charge group, right? One of right. our definitions uh, is that usually a charge group will be comprised of charges of equal visual weight. You know, this is not. Now, if this was on the field, that would be fine, right, if we didn't have the pale. This could be a primary tower and then a secondary star above it. But it can't be, you can't have two different kinds of tertiary groups on the same charge. All right, we also have something called an overall charge group, which is neither primary, secondary, or tertiary. And the rule on overall charges is it crosses the center of the field, it's placed partially on the field and partially on top of another charge. And the underlying charge is the is considered the primary. There's a, we can also only have one overall charge group in a device. We can have multiple secondary groups. We can have multiple tertiary groups. We can't really have multiple primary groups, and we absolutely cannot have multiple overall groups. Uh, and in period, the, over, the only overall charge you really see much of in period is a bend, or a bend sinister. Um, the other thing we need to know is it has to be mostly on the field, not on the underlying charge, and I'll show you what that means. So what's our primary charge here? The, the line. line. The line. Now, what's our overall charge? Bend. The bend. The bend. Now, this is the, an exception to that rule I was saying that usually, uh, that almost always a central ordinary is, a, um, is the primary. Here, a bend is a central ordinary, right? But in this case, it's not lying directly on the field. And that's a requirement. It's lying partially on the field and partially on the line. So the line is primary, the bend is over. And notice that the bend, much of the bend, is sitting on the field. It's not almost entirely on the line. And that's a good thing. Because the alternative is this. So what's our primary charge group here? The bend. mullet. Is it? Is the mullet The primary line? charge is the pale. The primary bend, charge is yeah, the pale. pale. Sorry. Yeah. The mullet is trying to be an overall charge, right? It's partly on the field and it's partly on the pale, um, you know, and it kind of crosses the center. This, uh, so, you know, I put it a little high, but let's pretend it's crossing the center. So it could be an overall charge, but is it, can you say that it's lying substantially on the field? No. Not, not really, right? It's pretty much almost entirely on the, on the uh, pale. This is what we call barely overall. It's overall, but it's just barely. And this is no good. We, we do not allow it. So how do you fix this device? You have two ways. You can make the mullet much larger, so it's a, a real overall. You know, make it fill almost the whole field, so much of it is on the yellow. Or make it much smaller and make it fit entirely on the pale, in which case, what does it become? A tertiary. A tertiary, which would be fine. And but that's probably better stuff. Uh, yes? You couldn't put a blue star on a red pail correct. like that. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're correct. Yes. You're correct. We're ignoring color. Yes, but you okay. can shrink it and change color. That's absolutely correct. We haven't gotten to contrast rules yet. Uh, but uh, I'm just... I, that, that was a consulting tip. You know, if you have someone that comes to you with this, the way you fix it for them is to either go bigger or go smaller. Uh, heraldry, remember, is about instant identification. We like things to be really clearly one thing or another thing. We don't like this wishy-washy, it's kind of neither here nor there. And a lot of our style rules um, are the result of that. You will see that in a few more places. We really want, you know, things to be very clearly A or B, not, you know, something something to do. All right, so we also, so the primary is a pale and overall is a mock. We also have what's called maintained sustained charges. This is charges that are held by another charge, usually by a primary charge. Um, and the most common thing is you see in period heraldry you see various animals like lions holding various weapons, swords, spears, whatever. The question is, how do we treat them? So we treat them in one of three ways. 
We have what's called. I'm sorry. One second. Can you go back, please? Sorry. Sorry, I had noise in the background. So maintain charges are much smaller than the primary charge. Um, and if they're much smaller, we pretty much ignore them. They're considered an artistic detail. Uh, we don't count them for difference when we're doing conflict. We're just, uh, you know, we may blazon them, but we're not going to give you any credit for them. And the reason for that is if you look at period armorials, you'll see the same, you know, family's charges that has, you know, a lion with a sword in one picture, and in the next book it doesn't hold the sword. So we're reasonably sure that period heralds didn't consider those maintained charges to be that important. They were, you know, some artists put them in, some didn't. But if it gets bigger, um, we call it a sustained charge. Uh, bigger means it's more than half of the visual weight of the primary charge, but less than the total visual weight. And in that case, it's considered a secondary charge. And now it does count for conflict, and now um, it has to follow various other ways. Finally, we have what's called co-primary charges. This is where you have the held charge is so big that it's might that it's the same visual weight as the primary. I'm hesitant to say just as big, because big is a little funny. We, we talk about visual weight. In that case, it's just part of the primary charge book. So if you have, you know, a lion holding, I don't know, um, a guitar, and the guitar is as big as the lion, uh, well then, really, you have a, pri pri uh, a primary charge group comprising of a guitar and a lion that happen to be touching. So this is a maintained charge. Right? This is a... What's our primary charge here? The dragon. the dragon, right? And the sword is maintained. It's clearly much, much smaller than the dragon, right? We're not going to give this uh, device any extra credit for having that sword. It's, it, it's a little artistic detail. How about here? Sustained. Yeah, I would call that sustained. So what's our primary? The dragon. The dragon. And now that sword is a sustained secondary. Now, the reason I said I don't like to talk about the size is because if you take out a ruler and measure it, that sword is just as long as the dragon is tall, if I remember how I drew this correctly. But does it have as much visual weight? No. I don't think so. No. It's, it's skinny. It's skinny. You really can't, I don't think there's any way to draw a sword that is so big, being held by a dragon, that is so big that it's going to have the same visual weight. You know, that's why I say, use as a, my example a guitar, because a guitar is... A fat charge, so you you could imagine a big guitar, but you know I can make that sword twice as big and still be a skinny sword next to a dragon. So that's a sustained second. So now we're gonna bring back some of our old friends from uh, the last section and talk about their primary charges. So this is the arms of France, azure, three fleur de lis, or what's the primary charge? Three fleur de lis. Yeah, easy one, right? Or, semi of eagles, azure, a cross ghouls. What's our primary charge? Cross, cross ghouls. And what's our secondary charge? Semi of semi eagles. eagles. Azure. Anything else? No, nothing else. We're, we're done. How about here? What's our primary charge? The star, the mullets. The mullets. And what's our secondary charge? The border. The border. And we've got nothing else. We're out of charges. How about here? What's our primary charge? The cross swords? The cross swords, yeah. Because, first of all, they're visually bigger, right? And second, uh, they're in the center. So those are the things we look for. So what What are the roses? Secondary. 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 Okay. What's our primary charge? The lion. lion. All right. What's our secondary charge? The border. border. And what's our th ter tertiary charge? The semi of roundels. The semi of roundels, exactly. Uh, remember we said that a tertiary charge is any charge that's on another charge? It can be on the primary, it can be on a secondary. Uh, it cannot, by the way, be on a tertiary. Uh, uh, core style rules do not allow what we call quaternary charges. You can't have, you know, you couldn't put a fleur-de-lis on top of each of those roundels. For one thing, it would be so small you'd never figure out what it was. Uh, that being said, you can register quaternary charges as an individual attested pattern, and in some very late period English kind of Tudor era heraldry, you do see quaternary charges. But there's a whole story behind that, and we can talk about that later. All right, how about this one? What's our primary charge? The bend. The bend. The bend. And this is one that throws a lot of people, because if you look at it, you say, but the mermaids are so much bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And they are. 
but they're not in the center. The bend crosses the center, and it's a central ordinary, so it's the bend. What's our secondary church? The, the two mermaids. mermaids. The mermaids. And our tertiary church? The three Fleur de Lis. The Fleur de yeah. Now, what about the mirrors and combs that the mermaids are holding? Artistic detail? Yeah, those are maintained charges, right? That's why we didn't even bother blazoning. Okay? The, the, the mirrors and combs are clearly maintained charges. They're really little. Okay. What's our primary charge here? There isn't one. The field? There isn't one, yeah. It's not the field. The field is never a charge. But I there isn't one. So this is primary field primary armory. There are no charges at all. It's Chequi or an Azure. Chequi is a field division. It's field primary armory, which means a whole different set of rules kicks in, and we're not going to go too far into those because they're, those rules are kind of an, a more advanced topic. How about here? Bari, Argentine Gules. Field primary. Field primary again, yeah. And if you remember from last time, we said when you have it evenly divided into an even number of white and red stripes like this, then it's Bari, which is just a field division. Now what about this one? Uh, the three the Chevronelles. Chevronelles. The Chevronelles, yeah. So why is this not Chevronelli? Because they're not even. It's not an even number. It's not even, yeah. This is a yellow field with three she uh, red Chevronelles because we have, you know, we, we don't have the same number of yellow and red stripes. If we had another little red stripe in the bottom of the corner, that could be Chevronelli. So that's something to watch for because sometimes something looks like field primary and it may or may not be, you know, or vice versa. Because you look at this and say, oh, the primary is, uh, is bars. No, th there's no primary. Um, one way to look at it is if you have a blazon and you think it's a good blazon, look at the blazon, right? Here we have a field, comma, a bunch of charges, right? Here, all we have is the field. There's no comma. There's nothing after the comma. Same thing up here. Okay? How about this one? Or a chief indented sable. There isn't a primary. There isn't a primary. So what's the chief? A secondary. No, it's not a secondary. Because you can't have a secondary without a primary. It's just a chief. This is field primary armory using that rule that says if all you have are peripheral ordinaries and a chief is a peripheral ordinary, then it's field primary. Okay? So it's technically not a secondary. Although I, I don't think you'd be too wrong in calling it that, but technically there's no such thing as a secondary without a primary. Okay, so that's charge group theory. Um, I urge you, when you have a chance, go back and look at it some more. Read Appendix I. Um, it's very, very important because everything we do for the rest of this class and everything we do in the next two classes, which are conflict checking, is built on charge group theory. So um, a lot of mistakes I see in commenting when people say, well, why doesn't X conflict with Y? And the, the answer is because you got, they got the charges wrong. The pri they're comparing a primary to a secondary or a secondary to a tertiary, and we don't do that. So it's very important for you to be able to identify what kind of charge group uh, everything is on a device. Moving on. So, armory rules. First thing we should be aware of is that uh, individual submitters can register six pieces of armory, which could be a device and badges in any company. And SCA baronies can register any number of pieces of uh, armory. So if you're working with a barony or a kingdom, you know, kingdoms have a badge for every award, for, you know, for everything. So there's no limit. There. However, for, bo all, for both submitters and uh, uh, groups, for individuals, you can only have one thing called a device. Everything, uh, this is what becomes known as arms when you get an AOA. Technically, if you don't have an AOA, you have a device. When you have an AOA, your device becomes arms. And uh, the device says, this is me. Okay, you put your device on your shield, you put it on your surcoat, you put it on your banner. The kingdom arms go on the king. It says, this is who I am. And when you submit it, you put it on a shield-shaped form. Even if you want to use it on a circle or a lozenge or a whatever afterwards, for submission purposes, all devices go on shield-shaped forms. So what's a badge? Well, first off, we allow lots of badges. You can have as many badges as your registration allows. So an individual can register one device and five badges, or six badges. You don't have to 
order a device. A kingdom or a barony or, or another group can register a, a device and as many badges as they'd like. So badges serve two functions in the SCA. One function is that it, it could just be an alternate device. Some people say, well, I have two personas. They're very different. They should have different armor. Fine. You can register one as your device. The second one becomes a badge. You use it exactly the same way. The only difference is when, a, when you get an award scroll, the scribe goes to look at your device and you use whatever is your primary device. And you can switch them. However, a more period, not a more period, a peer, what was known as badges in period is not alternate devices. They're things that are used to identify possession. This is mine. Okay, you put it on your possessions, you put it on your household members, you put it on your retinue. If you're a knight, you put it on your squire. Like if you're their a parent, you put it on your kid. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and if you look at it, every kingdom that I know has a populace badge. What's the function of that? Well, if you, unless you're the king or the king's herald, you can't wear kingdom arms. So how do you let the world know that you're from that kingdom? You use the populace badge. Okay, the kingdom has now marked you as being belonging to it. In the East Kingdom, that's the Blue Tiger. In other kingdoms, it's other things. Um, in Ethelmark, it's the Demi Escarbuncle, I believe. Uh, and uh, you know, I know in Trimaris, it's the Triketra. And I don't know all of them. But uh, in Anstior, it's probably a star of some sort. In Antir, it's probably a lion of some sort. Um, so that's that's what when you when we say badge. We kind of have two meanings for it. A badge is, there's the period meaning, which is something that labels, you know, possession, and there's also the more SCA administrative meanings, meaning a piece of armory other than a device. Now, an important thing about badges is that they can have a field or they can be fieldless. Devices must have a field, and everything we've really looked at and will look at has fields, but a a uh, badge doesn't have to, and when you submit a badge, you put it on a square-shaped form. Again, it doesn't matter how you're going to display it afterwards. You know, if it's an alternate device, maybe you'll put it right back on a shield, on a shield-shaped uh, thing, uh, or whatever, but we submit it on square-shaped forms. We used to submit them on certain round forms back in the day, but that's done. So, you can have armory with a field. And if you don't recall from the first class, when I put uh, those numbers and letters in parentheses, that's the section of Cena that governs that. Um, so, you know, it could be a solid tincture field, it could be a partitioned field, doesn't matter. But you can also have, with badges, you can have fieldless, which basically means you're not defining a field. It can go on whatever background you want, and the special rule that applies is it has to, every charge has to touch each other. And one way people say it is imagining if you were going to cast this thing out of metal, right? It's got to not fall apart. And very often badges are done as seals, as pins, as, uh, as things like that. So that's how they're used. All right. So most of you probably know this already if you have any interest in heraldry, but we'll go through it anyway. And that's the rule of tinctures. It basically says don't place a metal on metal or a color on a color. Last week we talked about metals versus colors, and the metals are argent, which is white, or silver, and ore, which is yellow or gold, and everything else is a metal, is a color. Uh, blue, red, green, purple, black are colors. So the basic rule is you don't place a metal on a metal or a color on a color. Um, we want what's called good contrast. And good contrast is defined as being between a metal and a color, but it can also be, be between a metal and something that's considered neutral, or color in something that's considered neutral. If you remember from last class, we talked about furs, and we mentioned very and potent, ver and potenty. Uh, and both of those are combinations of blue and white. There's an equal amount of blue and white. Those are considered neutral. You can put either a metal charge on it or a color charge on it without any problem. So good contrast is required when a charge is placed on a background. And the idea is identifiability. If you look at these, especially from far away, you can see that the ones on the left stand out much more clearly than the ones on the right. You know, the when you put that uh, white amulet on yellow, it's harder to see than the red amulet. When you put the white mullet on red, it's much clearer than the purple uh, mullet on red. And that's the point. Uh, going back to the origins of heraldry, we want quick, instant identifiability. We want to tell exactly what 
the devices. We don't have to sit there and try to figure out what's that purplish reddish block. So, how does that apply? First, anytime you're putting a charge on another, on a background, on the field, or on another charge, you must have good contrast, meaning metal on metal, color, metal on color, color on metal, or something in neutral. What about when you divide things? Well, as it turns out, you actually don't in many cases. If you're dividing a field into two parts, you do not need a good contrast. So for pale, azure, and ghouls, blue and red, absolutely fine. However, you can't have the same base tincture. So if you're, this is most, this has to do with first. So you can't have per pale, argent, and ermine. Because what that really looks like is that little thin black line disappears and now it looks like you've forgotten to put ermine spots on half your field. Okay, so you cannot have um, white and ermine. Similarly, you can't have black and counter ermine, etc. Um, when you're dividing fields into three parts, which is generally per pole or per pole inverted, the rule is you have to have good contrast between one of the parts and the other two. So if you look at the example labeled OK, you have two colors, blue and green, and you have one metal. So one part has good contrast with the other two. The one on the right is three colors. Black, blue, green are all colors. No part has good contact. This is not permitted. Good contrast. If you divide a field quarterly or you divide it per cell tier, you do not need good contrast. Again, the rule about no same base tinctures. So per cell tier, um, Azure and Ghouls is fine. Quarterly Azure and Ghouls would be fine. All other field divisions all other field divisions must have good contrast. So for example, this is paley uh, azure and purpur. This is uh, this is not, not acceptable because it does not have good contrast. And one of the things to watch out for is people will say, well the rule is it's if you divide into four or less sections then you don't need contrast. And you say this has only four se sections so this should be okay. No, the rule is not four sec or less. It's two, three, or those specific four, quarterly and per cell tier. Any other div division into four has to be good contrast. Um, now, on this next slide, I completely forgot about contrast rules when I made it, so just ignore the contrast issue. Um, we have a rule says talking about clarity of charge groups. And the rule says you have to organize them into, charges have to be clearly organized into charge groups, and you cannot do something that blurs the distinction between them. So let's look at this one. What's the primary charge group? The chalice? The chalice? Maybe. Or maybe all of them together, right? It's kind of hard to tell. Are they the same size? Are they the same visual weight? Well, the chalice is a bit bigger. This would probably not be registrable because it's not clear if this is a primary chalice and secondary estois. Those are called estois. They're stars with wavy uh, uh, rays. And, um, or is this five primary charges? So how do we fix it? Well, we go one way or the other, right? On that middle one, clearly that's a primary chalice, right? No question about it. And on the far right one, they're all clearly the same size. This is what I said before about A and B, right? We want it clearly to be one thing or clearly the other thing. We don't want things in the middle. Okay? So that's clarity of charge groups. And gen generally speaking, if you're looking at it and going, well, I'm not really sure what the primary charge, which one is the primary charge group, that's a pretty good indication that there's a problem. Yeah. All right. We have a rule called slot machining. Um, it says a single charge group may not contain more than two types of charges. Now we ignore things like posture and tincture. We're just talking about types of charges. So here we have a charge group comprised of an estua, a chalice, and a heron. That's three. That's no good. And we call it slot machining because it looks like what comes up on a slot machine. Uh, this applies to any charge group. Primary, secondary, tertiary, doesn't matter. You cannot have three different kinds of charges in the same charge group. Now this is okay. Can anyone tell me why this one is okay? Because it has the pale. Okay. 
So why does that such what? Primary. Huh? It has the p pale as the primary charge. The right. estual, est this wavy estual. star, yes. and the heron as secondaries, and the chalice as a tertiary. Exactly. That's ab absolutely correct, and that's exactly the point. It's all about charge groups. On the left, all three are part of the primary charge group. On the right, they're not in the same charge group, even though they look like they might be, right? They look like they ought to belong together, but they're not. The chalice is tertiary, the heron and estua are, uh, uh, secondary. are secondary. The estua is spelled E-S-T-O-I-L-E, -E, and if you ever meet someone who speaks fluent French and you want to make them jump and sh shudder, you call it an estoil. Nice. Um, That's good great. It's great fun to do to Brunison, if any of you know her. Um, okay. This is one of the more complicated rules. Uh, it's fairly new. It came in with Cena just about two years ago, and it's still very much uh, being, ex you know, we're still exploring the limitations of it. But it's, it's, the rule is called unity of posture and orientation. And what it basically says is that if you have charges in the same charge group, they must be either in identical postures and orientations, or they must be in a period arrangement which includes posture orientation. And there's a special rule that says you can do whatever you want with crescents because crescents are just weird. So this is not okay, right? This is all three this are the same thing. They're all three lines, but they're in different postures. There's one that is statant, there's one that's statant to sinister, there's one that's rampant. These, this is a violation of the rule of posture. Okay. Here's a, an example with orientation. You have two, these are called fions, they're stylized arrowheads, two pointing uh, bendwise and one pointing palewise, and inverted. So they are the same charge group, they, have, they do not have compatible, the same orientation, this is not permitted. And the reason these things are not permitted is because if you look at period heraldry, they just didn't do that. You know, um, it's just not the way they work. So, unity of posture is a whole complex thing. We could probably spend a whole hour on just that. That's as much as we're going to talk about it. Just, you know, read more about it. You will see more examples of it. Especially if you read commentary, you'll see this come up all the time. On the arrowheads. Yes. Just a quick question. If you changed one of the top ones so that they all had the point to the center, would that, that be? That would be fine, yeah, because that would be a period arrangement called in Paul. If you remember the pole, which is a three right. three-way division, now you've lined them up along the along the lines of a pole, and that's actually a period arrangement of charges. Okay, so that would be perfectly fine. The, one way to just think about this rule is if you can describe it in normal heraldic terms easily, then it's okay. But if you have to specify each item individually, well, this one is this way, and that one is that way, this one is the other thing then that's a really good sign that you have a unity of posture problem. Okay. Okay. So here, there's there's no way to describe this without describing each one of them. Well, I mean, you know, the top two are bendwise and the bottom one is palewise. There's no unified way to describe it. Whereas in your example, per Paul, that's how you, in Paul, that's how you do it. All right. We have some disallowed elements. First thing is restricted charges. They're in the Glossary of Terms, Table 3. These are charges that cannot be used by anyone. Uh, examples are the Red Cross or, cre or the Red Crescent, because those are reserved by international treaty for the, Red for the International Red Cross. Um, the Crown Rose is a symbol of England. You, know, you cannot put it on your device because you're not the King of England or the Queen. And the swastika is just offensive. You know, it's a perfectly period charge called the Philfot, but to the modern sensibilities, it's clearly going to be incredibly offensive. So things that are restricted are just no. Are just no. Uh, you, you absolutely may not use them. Reserve charges, which are on, in Table 2, are charges that can be used only by certain submitters. So, for example, a white belt can only be used by knights in this scene. A laurel wreath is reserved for only society branches. The chaplet of roses is reserved for princesses. Um, so a knight can register a device with a white belt. No individual can register a laurel wreath. And no individual can register a chaplet of roses either. 
because we only allow you to register things that are connected to your permanent titles. And Princess is never a permanent title. You know, in six months, that title is going to go away. So you can so uh, that, but a kingdom can register a device with a chaplet of roses for the use of the princess, and many kingdoms have. Finally, we have what we call unregisterable charges. These are charges uh, that are just that are generally set by precedent. That are things that are just not period. You're not going to find a table of them because there's just too many. But some examples are a garden rosebud. Uh, think of it as a rose, like a closed rose in profile. Uh, that's called a garden rosebud. We don't allow it because it doesn't appear imperial herald. Ribbons. You can't have a ribbon. Um, a recent one that came up is a selkie, which is a mythical kind of seal human thing. And the problem with selkie is uh, there's actually no stand... First of all, they didn't appear in heraldry. And secondly, even in artwork, there's just no standard depiction. Different cultures drew selkies in different ways. So there's no standard selkie. So these are things that are unregistered. Uh, steps from period practice, I put these under disallowed elements. They're not really disallowed, they're just discouraged. Um, these are things that are permitted because they're kind of similar to something that was done in period, but not exactly. And the rule is you're allowed one step of period practice, but not two or more. So if you have a device with one of these, it's registrable. If it's two or more, it's not. What? I'll give you a couple of examples. There's a lot listed in Appendix G. Uh, any non-European armorial element. So uh, both Islamic countries and Japanese countries had rich uh, heraldic traditions. But if you want to take an element from one of those and stick it into your regular core-style Western armory, that's going to be a step from period practice. Now, you can register the whole thing as an individually attested pattern, and that's fine. Then you don't have an SFPP problem. But if you're just, you know, a Tory gate, which is like the... You know, Japanese Shinto gate, and you want to put that on your device, we will let you do it, but that's a step from period practice. You only get one of them. Uh, okay. Uh, another example is non-European plants and animals. Uh, so you, in heraldry, they used all kinds of animals, but mostly from Europe. So if you want to register, you know, of late, we've seen a lot of badgers, a North American badger. That's going to be a step from period practice because while they did use uh, um, animals, they didn't really use a North European badger. Now, there's an exception if it actually was used in heraldry, in which case it's fine. There's no SFPP. Um, for example, the turkey. There's period arms with a turkey, which is a New World uh, animal. Uh, so turkeys are not a step from period practice. However, there's another restriction on this. It says it has to be from a part of the world known to period Europeans. So uh, interiors of Africa and North America, Northern Asia, Australia, none of those were really known to um, period Europeans. You cannot use animals from or plants from those areas. Um, if you recall from uh, the Book Heraldry 100 class, we talked about gray period meaning things that were around in between 1600 and 1650 are allowed in, that doesn't apply here because that period was very, very heavy period of uh, exploration, so there was lots of things discovered by 1650 that had not been discovered by 1600. And, uh, as I said, Appendix G lists a bunch of other charges and motifs that are steps from period practice, and there's a lot more in precedent. Um, one of the most popular ones is hoof, uh, paw prints. Animal paw prints, animal hoof prints, we will allow them their step from period practice. Another common one is what's called a wolf ululant. That's that picture from Arizona of a wolf howling at the moon. They didn't, period heraldic wolves didn't howl at the moon. We will allow it, but it's a step from period practice. All right, presumption. Um, there's a lot of rules dealing with presumption. And presumption means you're claiming. Um, some sort of a power, right, or uh, uh, identity that you are not entitled to. So the first thing is um, many of the restricted charges are prohibited as presumptive or as offensive, and using an unearned reserve charge is prohibited as presumptive. So if you want a white belt on your device, you first need to prove that you have been knighted in the SC. 
there's something called in period called arms of pretension or of pretense or augmentation of arms, uh, and these are ways to put additional things onto your device, which would prohibit unless you've been granted an augmentation of arms. In some places, it's called an augmentation of honor. and that's a single charge description or a charged cantop. So these are no good. That's a single charge description. It's charged with a roundel. Never mind that it's also a char uh, tertiary on top of an overall on top of a primary. But uh, it's a charged single charge description, so that's not permitted. And the next one has a charged canton. A canton is a corner. Uh, and if you put a charge on that corner, that's not going to be permitted unless you've received an augmentation of arms. Because this is how we show augmentations of arms in the SCA, either with a charged canton or with a charged description. Um, yes. Do you have a question about that? Sure. Because uh, something that I remembered from uh, a long time ago, I don't, I've never heard of anything, but I was told that you could put your branch in a canton on your shield device, and that was fine. Okay. So first of all, you can do whatever you want to do. It's fine. There's no heraldry police. We will not register it. Okay. If you want to display it that way, that's okay. Um, I don't think that's a particularly period way to display arms, but no one's going to stop you. But we definitely will not let you register. Right. Okay. I guess it would be the difference between registering yeah. and, and display. displaying. Yeah. But really, a better way to do it would just be to stick your uh, branch badge somewhere else on your... Because I know for a while, a lot of people were doing just like a blank shield, like white, yeah. and then they would just do a canton uh, up in the upper corner of the uh, Baronies. Um, I, am, I am not an expert on armorial display, so it's hard for me to say how authentic that is or is not, but I don't think offhand that's a very period way to do it. Doesn't, you know, doesn't right. mean you can't do it. It's just I'm not sure that that's really a thing. So what about the two on the right? Why are they okay? One Let's is a charge group, it looks like, and the well, other one is an uncharged canton. Right. So that one is easy. It's an uncharged canton. You can have a, a canton, just can't be charged. The, the, one in the, the yellow one is okay because it's not a single charge description. It's five charge descriptions. And that's perfectly fine because that was not a way to display augmentations of arms. Is that somebody's device? Who? Who? No, who this is just something I threw together. Dominoes. <laughs> yeah. No, I just threw this together for illustration purposes. The only real devices we've had in this class were the ones that were that we were going through the charge groups that we blazoned before, and those were from period or models. All of this is either based on examples out of scene or just stuff I made up. By the way, that white charge, anyone know what that is? The thing that looks kind of like the Stanley Cup in the middle? I don't, I don't have no idea what that is. Okay, that's a fun one. That's called a salt cell. And those are not chains coming over for, out of it. That's so, salt spilling out of the cell. That's all. You don't have to know that, but it's an interesting period charge, the salt cell. Okay, Marshall. Uh, we talked about marshalling in the last class in, in the context of history, but now we're going to talk about it in the context of rules. Marshalling is combining two or more arms into a single design, and it is not registrable in the SCA. We're assumed to each earn our own arms. You cannot combine them from your parents or with your spouse. You can display them marshalled, and yeah, it's yeah. perfectly appropriate for, say, a husband and wife to each register arms and then display them as impaled next to each other, but we're not going to register that combination. So, marshalling for rules purposes only occurs on either a per pale field or a quarterly field. Per pale can be demediation or impaling. We talked about that last time. And it only occurs with a plain line of division. So this device right here is not permissible because it is um, it's considered martial. This is, you know, the husband bearing uh, azure a wolf or and a wife bearing or a stag uh, azure and they've stuck them together. This is marshalling, this is not permitted. This however is just fine 
because marshalling was never in period was never done with a complex line of division. So since this is here the line is wavy, this is perfectly fine. This is not marshalling. Another way, by the way, to get rid of marshalling is to put a chief across the top. Uh, I don't think I have that in the slides, but that's a way to clear marshalling because that just was not done. They would not put a single chief across a marshal. Another uh, way to avoid marshalling is if you have a single primary charge group over the whole field, that removes the appearance of marshalling. So both of these are fine because they're both this, a single primary charge group made up of identical charges. Actually, I'm missing that. It should say single primary charge group of identical charges. So even though, you know, you could say, well, maybe two people with just really similar devices got married, we just don't treat it that way. Both of these are clearly one whole design, not two designs smushed again. That, those crescents, I, is that called something else, or is that just a crescent? That's a crescent. That's the default crescent. By default, crescents have horns to, uh, to chief. If they're upside down, horns to base, they're called crescents pendant. And if they're left or right, then one is an increscent and one is a decrescent. And I always have to look up which is which. OK? And another thing with presumption is you can have presumption from, through a combination of name and device. So even if a name is OK and a device are OK by themselves, sometimes the way you combine them is presumptuous. So if you have the name York, a York as part of your name, you can't put a white rose on your device, because that's, or a red rose in Lancaster, because that's implying that you're a member of the House of Europe or the House of Lancaster, which are important royal houses in period. So that's something to watch out for, um, you know, where you have a weird combination like that. And um, isn't there a rule somewhere? And I, I don't remember if I read this or if I read that it was not okay, but um, something about where if you actually do have um, arms or whatever, and you're permitted to display them, that it can be used or whatever. Or it, I, I can't remember exactly how. You mean if you have ar arms in real life? Yeah. Okay. Well, so if you have arms in real life, uh, you can display them all you want. We will absolutely not register them um, because same for the same reason we won't register your real name as your society name in, a, in the exact same form because you are not your persona and your persona are not you. And we have no authority over real armory. So you can use it, but it's not going to get registered. Uh, to, I just noticed that there was a conversation in chat about uh, selkies. Yes, you can register a seal. And you can register a woman main, maintaining a seal cloak. Both of those are fine, but you can't just say something that's a that's a selkie because no one really knows what a selkie looks like. A sea monster that has a fish tail and a or something, yeah, that would probably work. In fact, um, there's currently a selkie being submitted. It's an exception. It's the very last one that will be allowed. You know, it's permitted because that was when the decision was made not to allow them in the future, and. Um, it's. I would blazon it not as a selkie, but as a monster comprised of the body of a seal and the head of a woman. And that's okay, because you can have constructed monsters. You just can't have selkies by that name. I thought you couldn't have human on, humans uh, on a device. Sure you can. You can? Absolutely can. Huh. Yeah. Humans, body parts, no problem at all. Interesting. Lots of period... Oh, yeah. uh, I didn't know you could have a, a man or a woman on a yeah. device, yeah, so I, I would definitely have a woman maintaining a cloak. Yeah, no, you did. You make that cloak brown and call it a seal cloak. Yeah, Boom, selkie. Yeah, that's that's an excellent way to do it, and that's in fact what I we've had that come up in a conversation before, and that's how I would recommend it be done. Absolutely. Otherwise, I do a mermaid with a cloak. Yeah, the idea of a sea creature right. with a cloak. Yeah. Both, those are all legit ways to do it. Just don't call it a selkie in the blaze. Um, okay, so some final thoughts. Uh, and this is what I close with every time because I really think it's just that important. Um, a submission has to be registrable. It doesn't have to be authentic. Okay, we can encourage clients to design period-looking armory. We can't and shouldn't force them to do that. You know, if a client is set on something that's not very authentic but it will pass the rules, then it's uh, 
then it's your job to process it. You know, get, submit it, can't put it on the letter of intent, whatever your job is, you've got to do it. You know, we, we, we've got to uh, offer good customer service. That's a big part of this job. Um, you know, we're here to make registrations happen, not prevent them from happening. And we want to register things that they like, not what we like. I've heard several times from people saying, well, I registered my device, but I never use it. Well, why don't you ever use it? Well, I really don't like it because the Herald made me change it, and I don't like it the way it is now. Okay, that's not a good result. That, that's not a successful consult. You know, um, if they're not happy with it, then then there's a problem. And if you're dealing with a troublesome person, yeah, and yeah, that's why it's a customer thing thing. that is just not submittable. Yeah, submit that, that, it anyways, and let somebody else decline it. That absolutely. That and sometimes you don't have a tr any other choice. Um, you know, I I I will tell the client I think this is problematic. I think this may have issues. And if they insist, then yeah, then you send it up and let you know someone with a higher pay grade uh, make the phone. <laughs> So when you're cons when you're commenting, look for reasons to allow registration, not prohibit it. You know, it's perf uh, in reality we do both. It's perfectly fine to say, you know, well this violates rule X, but it's even better to say, well it technically violates this rule, but if they would just make this one small change, it would fix it. You know, that's a more useful kind of comment. We're trying to encourage people to. Um, to, to like heralds. We want a reputation for being helpful, not obstructionist. There's already a reputation among heralds for a bunch of people that always say no. We're really trying to avoid that. You know, uh, there's, uh, you know, if you listen to experienced heralds or even just experienced customer service people doing um, consulting, you will see. They, they never say, no, you can't do that. They say, well, that's that's an interesting idea, but let, let me show you something that might work a little bit better. You know, there's different ways to approach it, and it really is a very important part of, of this job. You know, it, it's not a job. You know, we're volunteers. None of us get paid, but it's still about customer service. And, you know, if you can't do customer service, then you can, you know, be a research herald, be a commenting herald, but you probably shouldn't be consulting. Anyway, uh, once again, I'm the Elmet Herald. I'm the East Kingdom Heraldic Education Deputy. There's how to reach me, and you can get this handout and the video links to the videos at yehudaheraldry.com slash ekhu. Um, and that's the end of our formal presentation. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take them at this point. Is there a next class? Uh, there will be a next class, but it's I'm not scheduling it yet. I will post announcements because uh, it's just nowhere close to being ready. Yet. All right. Next class 103 will cover um, the conflict checking rules and how to do basic conflict checking. That's my current plan. And then uh, I'm hoping to have a Armory 201 class that will cover. Um, more advanced conflict checking, and that'll probably be taught by either Istvan or Marie, who are very, more senior heralds. There's also some name classes coming as well. Um, in fact, Names 101 is probably going to be the next class that I run because it's ready. So you guys are certainly welcome to jump in on that one as well. And I will post them then. All right. I've been having a good time so far. All right. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, no problem. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next class. Yep. I'm going to terminate Thanks the broadcast much. now.